Hey, this is Catherine Davis' daughter, winner of 2015 CrossFit Games, and you're listening to The Expansion Project. Before we start the show, I want to tell you guys all about my new project called BreakParallel.com. It is the best place to find content from the functional fitness community on the internet. So what we do is we gather all the best videos of your favorite athletes and from your favorite companies, and we find all the dopest photos, we pick out all the latest news from the industry, and we put it in one place. So we're not reinventing the wheel here with this thing, but we are filling a void that we saw in the CrossFit world. So please bookmark it, share some links, and tell your friends about it. It's called BreakParallel.com. Welcome to another episode of the Expansion Project Podcast. I am your host, Fat Tony, and on this show, I have casual yet deep conversations with professional athletes, entrepreneurs, coaches, authors, bloggers, investors, musicians, and anybody that I find to be either successful or just plain interesting. And the hope is that I will expand my mind through these conversations and yours while motivating and inspiring people along the way. My guest today is Noah Olson, who finished eighth place at both last year's and this year's CrossFit Games. He is also on the Los Angeles Reigns National Pro Grid League team, and he recently was on a team that won the world champion title, uh, quote-unquote, of a fitness competition called the F45 Playoffs, which we'll get into that a little bit later on in the show. So on this episode, I will talk to Noah about his recent CrossFit Games experience and get him to give us a little play-by-play of the foot race seen around the world between him and Chad McKay. I will also ask him about his mental game and coaching, and I'll ask him about his recent move from Miami to Southern California. Before we jump into the interview, I want to tell all you guys, thank you for sharing the show with a friend. That is the only marketing we have right now for the show. So every time that you guys tell your friends about it or post about it online, it uh, helps spread the word and helps get other people motivated and inspired. So thank you guys for that. Also, thanks for the five-star ratings and the positive reviews on iTunes. Uh, That really helps spread the word as well. And uh, the more people listening, the more people we can have an impact on. Uh, Last but not least, click on theexpansionprojectpodcast.com and on the right side of the page there are some affiliate links uh, one of them for nutrisuma.com and you can use the promo code FATTONY1 on that website to get 20% off all your supplements and uh, I use their uh, creatine their vegan friendly pea protein and some of their other supplements as well so that is nutrisuma.com promo code FATTONY1 now that all that is out of the way I will introduce my guests Noah thanks for letting me drop in here on your training session my pleasure. Excited to be here. Cool. So please tell the listeners where we're at right now and why exactly we're here. We are at OCCF this morning in Newport Beach, California. And we are here because I have recently moved over to the West Coast from Miami. And I'm just getting a training session pre-grid league with Kenny Leverich, one of my good buddies. And yeah, that's about it. Cool. I did not know that you uh, lived out here. So I was going to ask, uh, you know, how, how's, why you've been out here since the games or whatever, um, but you moved here. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, kind of a temporary, potentially long-term move. My girlfriend, Dog, and I moved over about two weeks before the CrossFit Games to kind of settle in before that. And then after that, I had the grid league season, so we figured we'd stay out here for a couple months and not have to travel back and forth every weekend for our matches. And if we really liked it out here, then we were going to plan on staying. If my girlfriend can find a job or potentially um, apply to a school out here, then we may have reason to stay. If nothing clicks, then we could easily go back to the East Coast in Miami. So kind of just rolling with the tide right now, which is nice to have that freedom. Yeah, yeah, cool. So did you find an apartment out here, staying with somebody temporarily? We did, yep. Uh, My girlfriend and I are in an apartment in Venice, California with my good friend and manager as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, So that takes care of some of the questions I was going to ask about who's watching your dog when you're gone and stuff. So Max is out here. How is he like in California? Max loves California (laughs) so far. He's actually out in the gym running around with Kenny right now. They're playing tag. Yeah, Um, so if anybody hears some weights dropping in the background or any... uh, you know, hardcore metal music coming. That's uh, these guys getting in their training sessions. Yep. So also a big thank you to uh, Kenny and his partner Kyle over here at Orange Coast CrossFit for letting us uh, hang out in the locker room and record this. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so Max is loving it out here. The weather is a little bit different. It's cooler than Miami for sure. And he's best friends with my coach Dusty's dog, Kip, who's also a golden retriever. So every time we go over to Dogtown, they're just throwing down all day, having a blast. Oh, that's so cool, man. Yeah, I, I've actually, uh, this past January, got a little Yorkie puppy. Nice. And he doesn't have uh, 
many friends that he sees on a super regular basis, but when he does see like the dogs that he knows, yeah, just uh, it's so down. fun, man. It, it's so cool to watch them be For able to play sure. together and stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, I noticed when I was emailing you to try to link up about the podcast that you had a, uh, a Miami school email address still. Yep. Um, are you st- still in school? Are you finished no, school? No, I've graduated. I just haven't uh, really switched my email. <laughs> okay. But I graduated about a year and a half ago with a master's degree in strength and conditioning from University of Miami. Okay, sick. Damn, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize that was a master. That's that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Cool. So let's get on to some of the recent events that went down. Uh, cool. Most recently, I've got to know about this F45 thing. Uh, and for the listeners, I'm going to give you my background on this, um, and then I'll let you fill in the blanks too. Cool. So uh, I think somebody posted something online about it. No, okay. So it was the guys at Wadcast Podcast, Scott McGee. He posted right. something on Instagram or something. And I went and clicked on it, and I was like, what is this? And I, and I went to the website to try to figure out what it was all about. I was going to post some kind of news about it on breakparallel.com, and I couldn't really figure out what it was. Like, I looked at the website for several minutes, and I was like, uh, I can't tell what this is. Um, but then I had to leave the house. I was actually going to watch a BMX event nice. in Huntington Beach uh, at the U.S. Open of Surfing. I get down there, and lo and behold, F45 has this giant is. thing set up. And I was like, damn, <laughs> here it is. Like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, so I walked by a few times thinking... I still don't quite understand what this is, you know? And then I walked by a final time. I was about to leave, and I see you going to town on some push-ups and, you, you know, <laughs> thrusters awesome. and stuff. And I was like, oh, there's Noah, there's Kenny, there's Ronnie Teasdale. And I was like, so what the hell is this thing? Uh, and then later that evening, I saw that you guys won $100,000 as a team. So, A, congratulations. That's fucking badass. You Thank guys you. just, uh, you know, raked in 25 Gs each. Yeah, man, for uh, sure. But how the heck did you guys get involved in this and, and explain to people what it is? Yeah, so I'm about as clueless on it as you are still. <laughs> um, it, it was kind of a, a very last-minute thing. I had just finished the CrossFit Games uh, about a week prior to when that happened was happening and Kenny called me in the middle of the week. I was kind of taking the whole week off just Mm -hmm. recovering and he said, Hey dude, I know you just finished the games and you're still beat up. Hopefully you're feeling better. Any chance you want to do a competition with me this weekend? And I was immediately like, Oh no, not really into it. And he's like, we could win a hundred thousand (laughs) dollars. And I was like, uh, all right, maybe I'll reconsider. (laughs) So, um, kind of got some details on it. Looked at the website. Same thing was kind of confused. Like, didn't know exactly what the competition was or how the test was supposed to go down and after a while we figured it out kind of just winged it put together a team of four Mm -hmm. and showed up on the first day on saturday and was planning on just running through it one time kind of getting familiar with the course and then going back on sunday for what were supposed to be the team finals Mm -hmm. and somehow got roped into doing the course like four or five times on the first day which is 10 minutes at a time with some pretty tough intervals so um it i mean it was a, a tough test it's some kind of crossfitty stuff that's max squeaking a toy in the background <laughs> um but yeah so it's like a 10 minute thing you're doing 45 seconds of work at each station with a 15 second transition so it's 10 stations and some of it's crossfitty, some of it's kind of globo jimmy, which mm-hmm. was funny for all of us. So it like starts off with meters on a rower, and then you transition over to bench hops, which seemed kind of silly when we first did it. But was it, was it actually pretty, hard because it did look silly to dude, me? Dude, you know, it, it uh, a lot of this stuff seems kind of goofy, but toward the end of it, I was pretty smoked, especially the first time. Like mm-hmm. I just didn't know how to game it, so I just went hard for 10 minutes and it hit me really hard cardiovascularly mm-hmm. and it's a lot of jumping too so mm. it was a lot of kind of pounding down there on my lower legs and calves but um not too bad there was nothing nothing really heavy um and that's kind of where it differs from crossfit it's like just motor just go yeah a lot of lightweight stuff the heaviest thing we did was a 45 pound thruster oh, so yeah. like an empty bar basically yeah but um yeah we ran through the course the first time or a few times on saturday and saw Terrell Owens do it. He was out there. I don't know if that was planned or if he just showed up, but that was kind of funny. And then came back on Sunday and um, ran through it a couple more times. It was like a bracketed system. We ended up in the final heat against the Australian team, which were the prior champions. And uh, it was kind of cool. It was like single elimination. We randomly picked a name card of the guys that were on their team. Mm -hmm. And whoever you picked, you would go head-to-head with. Cool. And if you won against that person you get one point for your team so it's kind of best of four it was one of our guys versus one of their guys four different times and we ended up winning three of those so mm-hmm. we walked away with uh so the grand the uh the reps are what's counted right um yeah like- so it's it's a little strange or just not strange but just different from what we're used to because 
it's a, kind of like a weighted point system, and different movements are weighted oh, okay. differently. Got it. So it took us a little while to get used to it. I think that's why those guys had an advantage over us at first because they knew how to game it, like where to go hard and earn points right. and where to kind of hold back. Yep. So like the row didn't really count for much, but then you'd get like triple points for the strict pull-ups mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it would just take a while to kind of figure out like where to – Take it up a notch and right. we're tone it down. Um, so remind us, it was uh, you, Kenny Leverage, Ronnie Teasdale, and Nate, Nate Pontius. Is that how you say his I name? I believe so. Yeah. I, I had just met him that okay, day. Okay, cool. So. Um, yeah. So speaking about the uh, the game plan and uh, and those Australian guys and stuff, uh, kind of funny. They had put out a couple videos, sort of yeah. like calling out CrossFitters on their YouTube channel, yeah. and it seemed like a, just a straight up marketing tactic on their part, which kind of works because it got me talking about it. You know, I posted sure. the video on Break Parallel and. You know, I think people were like, oh, damn, like these guys are calling out CrossFitters. They actually specifically called out Rich Froning yeah. and Ben Smith and said, we'll give you each $50,000 if you can come here and beat us. And uh, they were kind of saying, like, we don't think the CrossFitters can do this. And then, of course, like all you CrossFit guys came and won right. and took their money. Yeah. No, I think that was funny. I was a little uh, skeptical of that at first, too, because we did the first date and then they released that video. Yep. And I was kind of like, oh, man, I, I didn't realize that these guys were kind of – talking trash on crossfitters and I, I didn't like that too much right but um i just as long as we were kind of recognized as like most people were like hell yeah crossfitters stepped in and kind of showed them and right um i, I think they were just doing it kind of jokingly and like you said as a marketing tactic totally. to try to get people to check it out and and it would have been pretty cool if like richard ben would have showed up i'm sure they would have smashed it oh for sure but uh <laughs> yeah and at the end of the day they were pretty nice just goofy australian guys yeah. like most of those dudes are and uh we had a good time and they ended up paying us and we're nice and fair and all that stuff cool. so it worked out yeah so i guess to to just try to fill in some of the listeners I, I think what i've gathered thus far like since all this now is that it's basically a training system or a training modality just like crossfit is and this is their competition series just like crossfit games is the, the competition of crossfit yeah um, and so they're trying to open up like affiliates or, or franchise gyms of this f45 training system throughout the world or whatever yeah um, so cool I, i'm stoked about it just because you know it gives people like you a chance to compete on a different platform show your skills to other people and obviously make money um, you know, for me, it gives me something else to post on a new website yeah, I, I just sure. launched and potentially maybe someplace else to shoot photos, which I enjoy doing. So I go. think it's, it's only a good thing when, you know, another new thing comes around. And, and it's if it's something that's trying to get people fit, then all the better, you know. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, for sure. As long as you're moving and grooving and having fun, then you could do it in any different gym or right. modality or test um so as we're recording this it's been about two weeks since the crossfit games um what were the few days after the games like for you like uh i, I kind of want to know how how beat up you were feeling like you know you said you were taking some days off yeah for sure so this crossfit games was i was gonna say the hardest that i've done out of the the two that right. i have <laughs> participated in but um everybody was saying that these particular games were really really high volume and left people feeling pretty smashed like guys that have been in it for a long time like ben smith and spencer hendel and that have done it for multiple years um it was just kind of the volume and the the way that it was designed it was just pretty taxing so i woke up on sunday of the game so we still had one full day to compete and i was like holy shit i'm mm -hmm. smoked like my arms were basically stuck at like 90 degrees and my quads were sore, my hips were sore, my low back, just everything was kind of beat up. Um, not not dangerously so, but just like really so. I, I kind of felt like, a, I don't know, like I, how I could imagine a warrior to feel like you're beat up, but you have no choice and you have to push through. And it was mm -hmm. kind of a cool mental test because I remember waking up and thinking there's no way I'm going to be able to perform well today. Right. But then once I got warmed up and got to the to the venue – we had our first workout, and I, like, just got into the groove and kicked butt, and it mm -hmm. was cool to kind of be able to mentally and physically push through that barrier. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, that's super cool. For sure. So uh, how long did you take off without working out at all after the games were so over? So I was thinking that after Sunday night when it was all over, I was still all beat up. My arms were all super tight, and uh, I was thinking, man, I'm just going to take a week off and, like, stay in bed all week and yeah. totally recover. And oddly enough, we woke up on Monday morning, and I was, like, itching to get out of bed. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to work out or anything, but I wasn't as exhausted or beat up as I thought. Mm -hmm. And it just took two or three days to kind of work out some of that soreness. And uh, by 
I guess the end of that week, that rest week, was the F45 right. thing. So that was the first thing I did, jumping right into it since the games yeah. and performed relatively well. So Cool. Uh, so speaking of performance, you placed a very respectable eighth place at the games uh, this year for the second year in a row. Um, how did you feel about that performance? I mean, obviously you would have hoped to win or get on the podium or whatever, um, but did you feel like you gave it your all and did you do everything you set out to do on the competition floor? Yeah, so this year was a little different for me in the sense that it was my second year out there and although I wanted to try to go into it with no expectations, I felt like it was a little hard to kind of push all that stuff aside and last year I didn't have any goals really I, I was excited to be there and I wanted to do well but I didn't say like oh I want to be top 10 or I want to make the podium and I think that helped me to stay really relaxed all weekend and just get out there and do what I did and have fun this year was slightly different just because I think in the back of my mind although I tried to avoid it I kept thinking like I should be doing well I can keep up with these guys mm -hmm. and um it started off well right I, I finished third on the beach which was our first event was feeling good and then I just had a really, really hard time the rest of the weekend trying to recover from what happened that evening, which was uh, the tipping of my wheelbarrow on the the sandbag event and totally like uh, an, an accident and a, a mess, up, mess up on my part. But it was just a, a big mistake that kind of started off my mental battle throughout the weekend. And then I had a couple more of those those big mistakes in there, some really great performances that I was pretty proud of, and then some big mistakes that kind of held me back. So last year, I feel like I was pretty consistent, and that was why I did well. This year, I feel like I did better in some areas, but was very inconsistent. That's why I did the same mm -hmm. when I should have done better, Right, I think. right. Yeah, that, that's an interesting perspective. So talk to me about that wheelbarrow incident. I, I remember sitting there watching, and... I was, like, devastated for you. I yeah. think you were the only only one that had the wheelbarrow tip over. I think there was one other dude, Stephen Fawcett, and okay. the heat prior. And I saw him do it on TV before I went out to warm up. And I was like, oh, man, just as long as that doesn't happen. Right, <laughs> right, man. Because, uh, uh. I mean, just to fill in anybody listening that probably everybody knows by now. But basically, you put a ton of heavy sandbags in a wheelbarrow. Yeah, you got 720 pounds. Right. So you got to wheel this thing across a big stadium floor. And halfway across, it tips over. And you got to refill it back up. Yeah. Um, so how did you kind of come back? from that mentally not only in that workout but sort of like right. the rest of the week yeah man so uh it was tough i was doing pretty well at the event i got the sandbags down there and loaded everything up and then literally as soon as i lifted the wheelbarrow off the ground i didn't even take a step i i kind of like don't even actually really remember what happened i think my mind like blocked the memory but as soon as i picked it up i know that it just flipped right over I don't know if that was my mistake for picking it up too fast or picking it up or setting the weight uneven, but it tipped right over and I immediately was like frantic, tried to tip it back over with half the sandbags in it, but I couldn't. So I had to pull them out, tip it back over, reload them. I probably lost about two to three minutes there just resetting that and uh, took close to last place on that event and immediately was kind of just had that really demoralized kind of crushed spirit mm -hmm. and i'll share with you guys that uh i got in the car with my girlfriend after and we were driving home and i like I, I really wanted to cry i felt like i had already ruined the weekend and i felt like it was almost going to be impossible to come back from it mm -hmm. and it turns out that it's not and i got a lot of motivating texts from people that kind of showed me rich froning's leaderboard from last year how he did really well on one and then did really poorly on another mm -hmm. and was able to come back and win it so that helped me keep my mind in the right place and try to keep pushing back and just stay resilient the whole weekend but again i made another few major mistakes that kind of held me back from pulling a froning mm -hmm. but um definitely a lesson learned and just hoping for no mistakes on a big competition floor like that in the future yeah so when you tipped it over and kind of like immediately went into that frantic mode were you able to come out of that and like pull yourself out of that frantic mode and like be like okay like let's take a step back like reevaluate and like get for back sure. on yeah i mean i was going back and forth with like there's no point of me even finishing this i'm going to come in last place anyway should i just not mm -hmm. do it and looking at the thousands of people up in the sand and saying of course i have to do this people are cheering for me I, mm -hmm. i'm not gonna quit so just pushing through and then actually for moments like realizing wow i'm actually kind of catching up to a few of the guys here maybe i can do relatively well mm -hmm. and 
kind of going back and forth the whole time, like very demoralized and then just having to grind through anyways and do what I could in the last yeah. moments. I think that's so fascinating to hear top athletes like yourself verbalize what that conversation in their head looks like during those moments and stuff. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, Murph this year, um, which anybody listening, I'll just keep filling you in. Uh, again, I feel like most people listening to this probably know, but just in case, Murph is an event that starts with a one-mile run, then you do 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, all while wearing a 20-pound weight vest. So you came in third on that event, which is amazing. Um, so I'm curious, did you practice that like with the weight vest a handful of times before the event? I didn't. No, I mean, um, I didn't know that we were going to do it with a weighted vest because they didn't announce that until like the day before. Mm. And I had done Murph in the past and they announced it like two weeks out. So I didn't want to do it and get all beat up and sore going into the games. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really touch it. Um, I just kind of knew that I had the capacity to do well without, or, or, I'm sorry, with a weighted vest, which I had done before. Mm -hmm. And when they announced that, I was pretty excited for it. And the vests were super custom and comfortable and it almost felt like they really weren't even there cool uh at first when we tried it on but then midway <laughs> through the event that was all i could think about was taking that thing off yeah. once it was over i bet i bet uh what did you do with that vest i, I think they gave you guys all like these custom jackets yeah they or did which was super cool it's, uh 511 tactical like actual I, I don't know the exact term i was gonna say ballistic i don't think that's right but <laughs> the actual uh vest that you could use uh for body armor and they switched the actual bulletproof stuff out for these cool rogue 10 pound plates, one on the front, one on the back. Mm. And uh, so we got to keep those and it's got our name on name and number and the CrossFit Games logo and everything on there. So I can use that in the future, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So what did you do with that? Is it? Like I have it still. Yeah. It's in, it's in our, in our car for okay. any time that I need to use a weighted vest. And a yeah, workout. I guess, I guess I was going to ask if it was kind of more like a, a trophy piece that you hang up or like something you'll, you'll use again. Yeah, it could be. I mean, we, there are so many little cool things that we get to take home from the games. Like we get our huge floor mat that says our name on it. You get another little placard. Mm -hmm. We get our credentials. You get a little coin. There's just so much that you can like, take your jersey and frame and right. so i'll pick one or two little things to hang as memorabilia and then i figure i may as well use the rest of the stuff like at regionals this year and at the games i think we got these really cool thick leather belts that said what place you came in and right. what region and i was thinking that that was kind of like a don't wear kind of just look at piece and i ended up pr in my back squad in it so nice very cool yeah if you get um, it may so, as well so use speaking it. of uh, trophies and awards and stuff i like to ask athletes this question too what do you do with your trophies and awards are you the kind of person that sort of sets them up and, and almost uses it as like you know a motivation piece on the wall or do you kind of put it in the closet and not really think about it um i i have a few trophy like back in the day of, of course in uh elementary school and high school and everything i have the trophies from flag football and all that that i don't know my parents have that somewhere <laughs> as for stuff more recently that i've kind of taken on my own um i definitely have those trophies up somewhere where i can see them like from Wadapalooza, from the ecc stuff from the crossfit games and regionals i like to keep that stuff um like you said kind of as a reminder and motivation mm -hmm. and uh an ode to my hard work that yeah. I put in and kind of recognition that I can do it. You know, if I came in first at regionals last year, if I look at it again the next year, it kind of reminds me, okay, you did it before, you can do it again. Yeah, cool. Um, so I would like to get uh, your comment on the programming this year at the CrossFit Games. Um, I don't want to use controversy as a word necessarily, <laughs> but you know, there, there's always talk of, of what people thought about the programming. And like you said, a lot of people said it was hard this year. There's been articles kind of arguing both sides of, you know, this one doctor wrote an article saying that the programming might have been too hard and, and, you know, maybe not smart on CrossFit HQ's part. And then there's other people arguing the opposite. And, right. and uh, so I, you know, if you can give your uh, candid response to that kind of thing and just tell me what you think about it. Love yeah, to hear for that. sure. So I love Dave Castro. He's my homeboy. And uh, I totally think that he did a good job of the programming and putting on a show for everybody. And it was a lot of fun. Um, we were definitely beat up and I think really the only thing that beat people up and the only reason that everybody was feeling the way they felt was from Murph and that I don't think that was bad programming I think that's just like no matter when you do that workout you're gonna feel that way mm -hmm. and the fact that it was on Friday left us with two more days to try to push through that and maybe that was kind of part of the plan you know like like I was saying earlier to 
feel like you're beat up and see how much you could push through that right. stuff. But um, I think that no matter what the programming was, we were all there to do it. You know, if, if he had announced that it was six more workouts after the, the ones that he had announced on the final day, then we would all kind of moaned and groaned but still done it because, you know, we're, we worked all year just to be there for that weekend right. and to be able to do that test. So it was kind of an, an honor to be able to take on all those workouts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from my just outside perspective, not having done any of that, um, the last event of the day basically was, uh, or one of the last events was the pegboard thing, mm -hmm. which seems like a lot of bicep work. And after something like Murph, like you said, your arms were kind of locked. Yeah, Do you feel sure. like a lot of people would have done better at that pegboard had their biceps not been shot um, from Murph? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, my, my arms were really, really tight. And I don't know if that made them weaker. I'm sure if I was fresh, I would have been able to do a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but in the in the moment, I didn't feel the pain or anything like that. Like earlier in the day, if I had to try to straighten my arm out, it would be really hard and I could feel it. Mm -hmm. But up on the pegboard, if I like reached up and put the peg in and that straightened my arm out, just with the adrenaline and competition, I didn't feel it at gotcha. all. Gotcha. Um, has there been talk amongst the athletes and, and yourself about uh, pegboard training this year? No, I don't think so. I mean... I'm sure that if we see one in a gym, we'll hop on it just as like a fun test. And yep. like I, I've actually, as soon as he announced it, I remember being at a gym and seeing one and being like, oh, that would be fun and not doing it mm -hmm. and thinking, man, I should have taken advantage <laughs> of that. So next time I see something funky like that in a gym, whether it's like a parkour wall or a pegboard or whatever, something like that, just going to do it for fun, yep. have that kind of knowledge in my memory bank yep. to use in case something like that comes up in the future. Cool, cool. So right now you're in the process of training for the next uh, few grid league matches. Um, so yes, just sir. give us a quick update of what's going on with the uh, NPGL and, and uh, LA Rain and stuff. Yeah, so we had one match prior to the games in San Jose and had fun out there. And pr after that, though, I, I told the team and myself that I really wanted to try to kind of put a little mental block on that for a little while and just focus on the CrossFit games as a priority. And then once I finished that, would get back into kind of the grid world. Mm -hmm. And I did exactly that. Um, kind of just focus all on that. And now that the games are over, I'm slowly starting to kind of get back into the flow of the grid stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's going to be too tough of a transition. It has never been in the past year. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all the same movements and just doing them really fast yeah. for short little periods of time. Um, so I'm curious now. So uh, you've got an interesting scenario here where uh, for your CrossFit training, Dusty Highland is your coach, right? And you work with him previously remotely from Miami. Uh, now I guess you're more local. Yep. Um, but you basically pay him to be your coach. And then now on the grid, he's kind of like paying you, not directly, but like you're the athlete now and uh, he's your coach still, but it's a different dynamic there. Um, so yeah. how does that work uh, coaching-wise and, and training-wise and stuff? So, you know, actually, um, this is probably a good juicy tidbit for the podcast, but Dusty is not with the rain anymore. Oh. Uh, yeah. He, is that very recent? That is relatively recent. I think it was just before the games. Okay. But kind of a mutual decision between him and the team. He has a lot of stuff going on between – him competing at the games himself, he finished 10th in the 40-45 in the Masters division. He is opening a new gym or just uh, transitioning his gym to a new location. He's coaching a bunch of athletes. He's got a couple that were in the games. Uh, he does a lot of other remote programming. He runs the skill wad. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, he was coaching the rain. So they kind of decided it would be better to take that off his plate and focus on all his other stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's not my coach anymore on the rain, which is kind of a bummer. But – the person that has stepped in, Max Mormont, seems like a really cool guy. I've had uh, some good interactions with him, so we'll see how he's able to take on the team and run us through the rest of the season. Cool. Not to deviate too much, but uh, who is this guy, Max? Well, um, I'm not familiar with him. Can you tell me his background or, or where you know, he's from? I, I don't entirely know his background too well. He, I know he competed in Olympic weightlifting for a while. He okay. did pretty well in that. And um, I think he is a coach at CrossFit Costa Mesa. Okay. And I think that that's how the owners of the LA Reign knew him. And he's just, he's a good coach. He's very structured, runs us through awesome warm ups, and uh, is pretty good at communicating with the team. We had him as our assistant coach for the first match. And so that's only the only really interaction that I've had with him so far. So that's all I can speak to. But 
I think that he'll do uh, a good job cool. with the rest of the season. Okay. Um, so we're going to uh, take a little sidestep here. We've talked about kind of what you have going on right now. We're going to backtrack a little bit. Um, I'm curious, when you got into CrossFit, was it something that you were doing to – get fitter for or, or prepare for a better a, a different sport or did you get into it looking at that as a sport in itself and to comp- compete in crossfit um you know i kind of stumbled on crossfit like i i didn't know what it was wasn't planning on doing it wasn't really interested in it and walked by peak 360 one day and tried to work out out and got my butt kicked and really loved it i was into fitness prior to that but more of like the bodybuilding stuff and was kind of just starting to get into different intervals and high intensity and all that. So stumbled on CrossFit, had a really great workout for the first time, enjoyed that and kind of just like everybody else that does CrossFit for the first time, quickly got obsessed with it, was Mm -hmm. going like every day and fell in love. And after a little while was already like interning at peak, trying to work out with Guido in his spare time, wanted to coach there, was doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Eventually got my level one and started competing, and here we are. Okay, cool. So uh, so you didn't get into it with the idea of competing. That just kind of came yeah. naturally. No, not at all. Um, I didn't even know there was CrossFit competitions. <laughs> I hadn't heard of the CrossFit games until the Open rolled around the first year. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So was there a clicking point when you thought that you could have potential as a competitor or when somebody else saw that potential in you? Um, I think that – I don't think that I saw that really at first. Um I picked up on movements pretty quickly. Like, I think I got a muscle up the first time that somebody showed me, and giving pull ups and all that stuff came kind of naturally to me. So, I think Guido saw some potential and helped me out with a little bit of extra programming and work. And eventually, just because I liked it and liked the push, I started working out with Guido and Chase Daniels and John Adams and a bunch of these other guys that were competing at a high level already, Jared Davis. Um, and I think that really motivated me to want to get better to be able to keep up with them because I definitely wasn't at first. And that's kind of when I started deciding. Once I was finally able to hold my ground and start to kind of kept catch up with those guys, that's when I started competing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so Chris Spieler, uh, obviously a, a very seasoned CrossFit athlete, he wrote a blog post about kind of how CrossFit takes a toll on your body when you're a high-level competitor. Um, I'll link to that in the show notes as well for anybody that wants to check it out. Um, but the sport's kind of so new that there's not a lot of people that have been in it for that long to really feel those effects after many years. Mm-hmm. Um, and the blog post, he kind of talked about, you know, his uh, quote-unquote exit from competition life, whatever, retirement, if you will. Uh, I'm curious, you as a young competitor, have you thought about kind of the longevity of careers and, and, you know, life after CrossFit competition thing yet? I haven't much but I'll tell you that this year at the games, I was starting to think, man, it's it's a really just this week of the CrossFit Games is a very, very mental, physical, and emotionally taxing week. Yeah. And like it, it's difficult to gear up. And I was wondering how long that my body will be able to go through that. I, I mean, it's only once a year. It's only a week out of every year. But it's it's pretty tough. Yeah. So. I'm just going to keep rolling with it until I kind of say that I'm done. And for a lot of these guys, it seems like that never happens. Like I read a post that Graham Holmberg just put up that Mm -hmm. he's getting older and he's been in the sport for a little while and was thinking that he would start winding down. But after he finished the games this year, he's just as fired up to go back next year. So I'm sure it'll kind of be a never ending cycle like that. (laughs) Gotcha. Um, So I'm curious about your mental game and what you've done in the past to, to sort of build that up. Um, I've talked to athletes that have read like sports psychology books and yeah. you know, some people are into meditation. Uh, some people have like life coaches or, or just their athletic coaches help them out with that. What has helped you build up your mental game? I haven't done too much with that, but recently I did start to try to get a little bit more interested in that stuff. And I bought a book called the champion's mind, which has a lot of really, really cool anecdotes in there and stuff that I was able to pull out and use during competition. Um, I think that that helped me a lot at regionals. I felt really, really, really mentally strong. And then I continued to read the book and thought that I would carry over into the games. And I don't know what it was at the games, but my brain just freaked out on me. And I did not have an easy mental time yeah. out there I don't, for whatever reason. I don't know if it was just recovering from that wheelbarrow thing the whole weekend or what. But I was pretty stressed out at night going to bed and trying to, like, 
anticipate the next morning and and i just had a really tough time and uh definitely need to put a little bit more work into that so i can be more comfortable and focused and confident going into that yeah the the champion's mind book do you remember the author of that i'd love to look that up and link it in the show notes oh, as well man. um i can find it for you right now let me think about it for a second i'll get back to you on it um so another thing i was curious about is that uh, maybe in this book or something else, uh, do you remember a specific moment that something kind of clicked or maybe just like a good takeaway from the book that, that really stuck out to you that you could sort of pass on to the listeners? Yeah, so um, there's one cool thing that is actually the the background of my phone and it says, think gold and never settle for silver. So that was like in the first chapter, it says that you should always, 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 no matter what, be thinking about that gold medal or that gold medal moment, whatever that is for you and try to carry that into your everyday life. Like it says to imagine that you are the champion of your sport, like pretend that you won the Olympics or you won the CrossFit games and how would you carry yourself then? And how do you go into your training sessions then? So that's kind of one thing that I've tried to change my approach on is just be a little bit more confident and comfortable in that position. And just always in practice sessions, be thinking about what I need to get to that gold Mm -hmm. cool um so let's see as you are kind of getting more into limelight these days and and getting more recognition and coverage and you know you have a big fan following and social media presence and everything um do you try to put a certain image out there of yourself throughout your social media uh, or do you do try to portray yourself in a certain way Uh, or are there maybe things that you try to keep private or intentionally like don't choose to show to the public through your social media no, man, I'm totally just me on Instagram, and uh, I hope I come off, come off as, like, a happy-go-lucky guy and that I'm just making people smile and having a good time because that's what I'm trying to do in life. Mm-hmm. And um, I once or twice back in the day, I've gotten, like, a comment about being cocky, and I hate that. I really, really don't want to be seen as that. So mm-hmm. I kind of do my best to try to – if anything could be portrayed as that, I'll try to change that up or pull that back because yeah. I definitely don't want to be seen as that. I want to always try to stay humble, and that's about it. Other than that, it's just kind of free-flowing stuff that I'm doing during the day mm-hmm. and my life between training, my girlfriend, my dog, all that fun stuff. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit and comment on some of these. You mentioned that you were kind of into the bodybuilding type thing a little bit before. Back in the day, um, yeah. And uh, this is kind of a question out of the blue, but uh, a lot of people have talked about your abs. <laughs> you have really nice abs. There you go. Uh, I'm jealous myself for sure. Uh, you said you were into bodybuilding. I'm curious now that you're doing CrossFit, do you do anything specific to train your abs to get them to look the way they do? Or is it just no, the built-in stuff? No, not at all. Stuff? So I, I don't know how that happened. or I, like, I don't know. I've always kind of been pretty lean, I guess, in high school and all that stuff. Um, there we go. I found the title of the or the author is Jim Afremo. It's A- uh, yes, okay. A F R E M O W. Cool. So I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. And actually, for anybody listening to this podcast, um, somebody's fired up out there. It's gonna yeah. be PR'd. I don't know if you guys can hear this, but lo- lots of action going on in the gym out there. Um, so actually, uh, earlier in the week, I interviewed Katrin Davis' daughter, who nice. was the winner of the, the female CrossFit Games champion, and she actually mentioned that book as well. Oh, okay, um, cool. With, with her mental game. So awesome. So I'll re- relink to that. And also, uh, just go ahead and cheap plug here. If anybody listening to this has not checked out that episode yet please go check it out uh, it's a really cool interview with the uh, world's fittest woman yeah cat's a cool chick um so yeah you're, you're talking about uh, not training the your abs abdominals yeah. um so in high school i actually before any of this crossfit stuff i did the old p90x and uh did the ab ripper x portion multiple times yep. throughout the week and i think that might have kind of gotten it started mm-hmm. and you know, I, I really don't do any ab-specific training since I've gotten into CrossFit. I kind of just focus on everything that I need to do to get stronger and more efficient in my movement. And it's funny because I used to be into the ab stuff. And when I started CrossFit, I did a day of heavy – it was either overhead squats or front squats. Nothing to do with abs. And I remember the next day my abs being really sore and being like, what the heck? What did I do? Yeah. And asking Guido about it. And he said, yeah, it's all the stabilizer muscles. When you have heavy weight over your head, your core has to be really engaged and tight. And that kind of clicked for me. I was like, wow, okay. I, I don't need to focus on that stuff because it's getting worked no matter what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so 
I had a, uh, a friend of mine, actually a coach of mine from my gym, chime in, and uh, I asked you know, some people on my Facebook nice. what kind of stuff I should ask you about. And I actually got a really good one from uh, my coach, Fernando. He said he would like to hear a play-by-play of uh, the foot race between you and Chad okay. McKay. So I've got the video pulled up here, nice. um, and I would love to play it. So just to fill in the listeners, uh, during the first event of this year's CrossFit Games, it was uh, a long swim, and then uh, uh, you fill us in. I'm, yeah, I'm so we a had a 500-meter uh, swim around the pier, yep. and then we would all run onto the sand, grab a prone paddleboard, these really, really cool paddleboards that this guy, I think Brian was his name, apparently like a legend in this uh, particular brand of surfboards, made for us custom. And we grabbed the paddleboard, took it out to the water. We had to paddle down parallel to the shore one mile one mile back ditch the board swim back around the pier another 500 meters and then sprint through the finish right so this is a lot of work over a pretty long time domain and to have two people finish like almost dead even is pretty unheard of like that that's unheard really crazy. of and unfortunate because <laughs> man that hurt i bet so uh Right after that happened, uh, like that night, uh, one of the guys from CrossFit HQ had a really dope, yeah. uh, like steady cam. Heber, uh, badass. Yeah, th- actually, he's a incredible filmmaker. I was able to watch his Rich Froning documentary. Yeah, I need to check um, that out still. Anyway, so so he put up a video clip, 43 seconds long, of you and Chad McKay both sprinting out of the ocean at the same time mm. to the finish line, and uh, the you know the video was kind of seen around the world. It was uh, a really epic shot. Um, so I would love for you to watch it yeah, on the sure. phone here and just give us a play-by-play of kind of what was going on and what you were thinking at that time. Um, I actually forgot to set this up ahead of time. I think you might be able to hear the volume on the podcast. Let me try it out first, and then I'll pass it over. All right, there look at that. Go. Perfect. Damn, I'm better at this mixer man. thing than I thought. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pass the phone to Noah. Cool. So I'll just kind of fill you in prior to when this video starts. Yep. On the, the final 500-meter swim, I got back into the water decently ahead of Chad, not like a huge stretch, but I, I knew I had him by a while, but he had beat me on the first swim, so I knew that I had to keep moving because he could have caught me in the water. And so as we came around the pier, I would periodically flip over and do a couple backstrokes just to kind of eyeball him and see where he was. And the whole time I probably had like back and forth between a 10 to 20 meter lead on him. Mm-hmm. And I could hear people as I was coming in the final stretch up on the pier yelling down to me, they were like following me down the pier yelling like, he's right behind you, can't stop, gotta go. Mm -hmm. And so I I sprinted the final probably 50 meters out of the water and I thought that I had him by a decent enough stretch that it wasn't gonna come down to a foot race that like, I was gonna have to run but I didn't think I was gonna have to sprint. Mm -hmm. So I start like getting out of the water, doing high knees over the the little choppy waves there and um, Little did I know he was, like, right behind me. He's got bigger legs, so I guess he was able to stand up out of the water sooner than I was. And so I finally get out of the water onto the sand. I'm just kind of running without knowing, and in my peripherals, I see him. So I'll kind of start the video because that's where it happened. So right here, I had no idea that he was behind me, right? So I'm still just kind of hopping out of the water, get up onto the sand and start running at a normal pace. And then I think, like, right here, as soon as he comes into the frame of the video, I kind of glanced to the side and saw him and said, shit. <laughs> so we both picked it up. We're booking it literally back and forth. Like, he would take a little bit on me, and I would take a little bit on him. And toward the end of it, we both just had the jets going at 100 miles an hour. And I think his legs just tired out on him 10 meters out, and I was able to hold off. <laughs> and it's funny because... I was so exhausted that right as soon as I crossed the finish line, I just collapsed onto my knees and my stomach. And uh, I remember seeing Chad walk by, and I was like, you big bastard. Like, I didn't <laughs> think it was going to come down to that, but it was a really, really cool, epic moment. And yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, in this clip, I'll link to that as well in the show notes. In the clip at the very end of it, you just he, he comes over and kind of gives you a high five, and you just look up and you say, epic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It <laughs> was. Like, you, it was, you knew it was one of those, like, sports history moments kind of, you know? It was just a battle. Yeah. That reminds me of the, uh, like, I think it was Chris Spieler and Graham Holmberg on the track event from a few years ago, like in 2013, where they had a sprint off like that, and uh-huh. Chris, like, topples through the finish line and falls over and – one of those moments. So it's cool to be able to be recognized in CrossFit Games history if that does go down as something. Yeah, yeah, totally. If they if they do like a sports center like top ten moments, like yeah, that, that'll go. make the highlight real for <laughs> sure. Um, 
So you, you mentioned kind of falling over at the end of that workout, um, and it made me think of when I'm at the end of a workout and I know I'm about to finish, I have this bad mental game where if I know I'm about to finish, I almost like want to collapse ahead of time instead of waiting until I'm finished to collapse. Yeah. Um, so what's your uh, thought process when you kind of are about to finish and know that you're going to collapse at some point? So I'm kind of the opposite, right? If I know I'm about to finish, then I'll just kind of like – crank it up all the way and just totally squeeze all the juice out of myself as I can so that when it is over, I'm just totally smoked. Yeah, and and that's obviously the difference between an elite athlete and somebody (laughs) like myself, you know. Yeah, I mean, we all have those moments, though, where you just kind of don't have that extra push in you. It's tough to find. Yeah. But in the moments when it matters, definitely make it happen. Yeah. So I've got a few random questions before we get to our uh, quick hits. One of them is, if you were to, let's say, go to the gym for a training session, but you, for some reason, only had just a few minutes to kind of warm up and mobilize or, or stretch out, um, what would be, like, your go-to, like, I must do this before a workout or, like, this is my, my quick warm-up stretch or whatever? Uh, I, my go-to is usually, like, a, a mix-up of an inchworm. It's just I kind of feel like it hits every part of my body. So I'll reach down, touch my toes with kind of straight legs, walk my hands all the way out, lift my chest up into I think that's an upward dog Mm -hmm. push back into like the downward dog and then I'll do a lunge on each leg and then walk my feet back up to my hands just like a really easy way to open up your hamstrings your hips your core uh, a little bit more of the legs down there it gets your shoulders when you're pushing your head back through your arms so if that's really all I can do I'll do like two or three of those and jump right into it if it's if I have more time then I'll probably grab a barbell and do some stuff that's more specific to what I'm going to do in the workout. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to preface this question with a, a quick little story of, of my own superstition or, or kind of weird uh, quirk in the gym. So when we have like an AMRAP, you, you, a lot of times we get poker chips to count our rounds, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll kind of set an idea in my head of like what I know that I can get, what I hope that I can get, and then kind of like what I would really, really hope that I can get. Yeah. And I'm uh, maybe a little OCD or whatever, so I take – one color chip for all the rounds that I know that I can get. <laughs> Another color chip for what's like the last round of like, okay, like I should be able to get this if yeah. I really push hard. And then a different color chip like of like my zone. bonus round. Yeah, exactly. Talking about orange theory over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm curious, do you have any superstitions or like kind of quirks like that in the gym or maybe any like pre workout ritual kind of things? Nothing in particular um, that has to do with like an object or anything like that. One little pre-competition workout ritual that I have developed that I think helps me keep my mind in the right place is to just kind of take a deep breath and smile before every workout Mm. because I used to, when they put us in the corrals going out for the workout or even in the gym, whatever, when I was about to start, I would get really like fired up and focused and in my own little world, like have my blinders on and just like this little rage inside my head and I'd go out mad. And if any little thing went wrong in the workout, it would just blow up on me and would just be really bad. I'd have all this negative energy. And I realized that if, like on the workouts that I knew I was going to do well on and that I was excited about and had fun with, I was like, wow, I I did much better. Even if I made a small mistake, I was able to recover from it. So every workout, no matter if I'm looking forward to it or not, I know I'm going to do the best that I'm capable of i'm going to give it my all so i just try to take a deep breath smile and go out there without like over stressing it or worrying it or really freaking out about it and it helps a lot cool yeah all right so we're going to move on to the section that i call quick hits which is uh sort of rapid fire questions that i ask all my guests typically the same questions might be able to shut the door i don't know if that music is, is too is loud is there a door there yeah i don't know uh, if anybody can hear we've got a uh, little bit of offspring playing in the background They're of the just gym. jamming out there let me see uh, if i could shut that door for a second sure So I'll just give you guys a play-by-play while he goes and shuts the door. I already knew that there wasn't a door there, but I thought maybe I'm crazy and maybe there was a door there, but there's not actually a door closing the locker room off from the gym. So now Noah's back. He's putting the headphones on and Max is Boom, hanging out with back us. back in action. So we're back in action. Um, so my first question is how do you decompress? Um, so if you, you know, you're, you're taking some time off or just, you know, in the evening after a training session, like what do you do to kind of unwind from the day or from, a, from yeah. training? I'll just totally kind of wrap myself up in Max and Joanne and they're kind of my happy place and just uh, it's funny Joanne actually showed me a video on a TED talk about oxytocin and when you're 
like connected with somebody that you're really close with, your body releases this hormone that helps you to relax and feel better. And so every time that I'm able to like really, really get a nice embrace or a hug, I can kind of like almost feel and see that chemical being released. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I, I will, I'll definitely try to look up that video and, yeah, uh, and link sure. that in the show notes. I'd, I'd be interested in checking that out. Um, so this is an interesting question that uh, some people have no answer to. Other people have similar answers, and then there's always kind of the curveballs out there. Um, so if there was a movie made about your life, what would be the hardship or obstacle that you kind of overcame in order to be where you're at at this point in your life? Fortunately, I haven't gone through anything incredibly traumatic in my life. Uh, well, you know, I take that back. Um, it would probably, I mean, the toughest thing that I've been through in my life emotionally and kind of spiritually in my senior year of high school, my best friend Kevin passed away in a car mm. accident. And that's why I have the naked tattoo on my arm. It stands for Noah, Alex, Kevin, Eddie, and Daniel. And Kevin is in green and has a little halo and angel wings to kind of remember him by. So that's probably the toughest thing that I've ever been through. And to be able to kind of get through that with my friends and family and kind of develop and grow from that has mm -hmm. been a, a big thing that's impacted me a lot. Yeah. Um, outside of that, though, like, I haven't been majorly injured. Mm -hmm. I haven't been, ever been homeless or anything crazy like right. that. So I've been lucky in that sense. But, um, yeah, that's one thing that definitely okay. has had an impact on my life. Yeah, for sure. Um, so have you had any mentors throughout your life or anybody that's really just kind of helped guide you along the way? Guido Trinidad. That guy is uh, definitely my, my best friend, my mentor, my hero, my idol. Yeah, he's a, a really fantastic person. Uh, and is even he the before, owner of the gym in Miami? Yeah, so he owns Peak 360, the gym that I've been at since I started CrossFit down in Miami. And I would say even more than being a great athlete, he's just kind of given me an example of being a great person. He's a, an incredible father. He just had his first baby girl. She's two years old now, but he's been with his wife and her stepdaughter, or his stepdaughter for uh, multiple years now. And to kind of see the way that they interact and how he treats them has been awesome. And the members at his gym... And then also as an athlete, always trying to keep up with him and learn from him. So he's had a huge impact on me, and I don't think I'd be sitting here talking to you right now if it weren't for him. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, last one, but certainly not least, do you have a favorite quote or maybe a piece of advice that someone's given you uh, or just kind of words you live by? So in regards to Guido and starting off at Peak 360 back in the day, there was one thing in the strength room they had written up on a piece of paper just taped to the wall that said nothing replaces hard work. And that's kind of always, always, always been my thing because I didn't start off with any incredible talents in CrossFit. I was relatively good at gymnastics, but no strength training background at all. And so I've literally just had to build everything from the ground up and put in a ton of work in getting strong lifting like the barbell to start and just trying to add weight to that to get to the weights that I'm able to lift today and stuff mm -hmm. like that so just putting in that hard work is yeah. something that I'm always going to be able to or I'm always going to have to do if I want to be able to achieve great things yeah so uh, just kind of an aside here, um, I've interviewed a lot of top professional BMX riders for my podcast. Um, I'm just now starting to interview some of the top CrossFit athletes. Cool. Um, and I started with kind of the top, uh, like I said, the, the fittest woman in the world, Katrin David's daughter. And she actually said something, I don't know if it's the exact same words, but very, very similar to that yeah. uh, for, for one of her quotes as well. Um, so I, I think that's super cool to see that reoccurring theme, like, you know, even with that book and this quote and stuff between sure. some of you top athletes and stuff. But especially coming from her, too, like, she's such an incredibly talented gymnast. I think she did that growing up. So, but even with that, you see that it does come down to hard work. You know, she can't just rely on those skills right. and just glide by with being naturally gifted. We all have to put in a lot of hard work to get there. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to end there. Uh, please tell people where they can connect with you or, uh, you know, find you online or give any other websites or, or plugs that you want to give. Yeah, I'm pretty much just on the gram. Um, my Instagram thing is at Nolson. It's N-O-H-L-S-E-N. And Max has a pretty cool Instagram, too. It's at Maximus Olson. Um, other than that, I've got a, a Facebook page, like a Facebook athlete page, I believe, which is still crazy to me that I needed to make one of those. But <laughs> I appreciate everybody that wanted content on there. Um, I've got a FitMoo account 
which is relatively new and pretty cool too. So you guys can check that out. I'm supposed to put uh, a little bit more lengthy videos on there, which I wasn't doing as much leading up to the games, but I'll try to put some full training sessions and stuff up on my FitMoo page. And that's about it. That's all I got. Cool. Sounds good. Well, all those will be linked on the show notes to this episode. Sweet. So that will be on the expansionprojectpodcast.com. While you're at the website, please uh, go ahead and click on the affiliate links on the right side of the page. Again, you can use the promo code FATTONY1 on Nutrisuma.com to get 20% off all your orders there. Uh, there's also an Amazon link, and uh, anytime you buy something from Amazon, which who doesn't buy from there, uh, that'll kick back a few pennies to the show as well, which will help keep me rolling. Dope. So you guys can find me on Instagram and all my other social networks at FatTonyBMX. And, of course, uh, please go ahead and check out BreakParallel.com. Again, that's my newest company that I started with a partner of mine. And uh, I think we have some really big things planned for the functional fitness world. And uh, it's going to be a really cool growing project and uh, fun to watch evolve. Um, so bookmark that at BreakParallel.com. So until next time, Noah, thank you so much for hanging out. Awesome, Max, dude. thanks for being here too, buddy. Yeah, thank you guys for having us. We really had fun and hope that everybody else out there enjoyed it and took something from it. Cool. Thanks a lot, buddy. Thank you.